We've traveled thousands of miles, and not all of it by jet ski, to what could legitimately be called paradise. St. Pete in Clearwater, Florida is famous for its white sandy beaches, fresh seafood and gorgeous sunsets, but less so for its unexpected cultural quirks, one of which is an incredible brewing scene. So for the next few weeks we're going to show you just how spoiled the region is for its amazing beer, world-class breweries and even unique local beer styles. This week we're visiting one of the area's oldest and most respected breweries, Greenbench. With their annual mixed firm festival Food for Thought and the amazing wild beers they make, they have a global reputation. But as always with the best breweries, it's how rooted they are in the local community that amazes us most. We met founder Chris Johnson in his modern, welcoming taproom in central St Pete. So I'm here with Chris, one of the founders and head brewer here at Greenbench. Firstly, what a stunning space you guys have put together. Thank you. Um, Brad's already raving about the plastic chairs, <laughs> so <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's good. Um, how long have you guys been in this site? Was this the first site? Yeah, this is the first site. We opened uh, September of 2013, so we've been here since. Yeah, and it, does that make you one of the oldest breweries? Ironically, in? yes. Yeah. We, uh, we're actually the oldest like sort of production microbrewery in St. Petersburg. Technically, there was one other place that had a license before us. Um, it was called Brewer's Tasting Room in St. Pete. And at the time, they had a small like one barrel system and they would only let like home brewers could come in and make a beer and sell it at their spot. And like, that's all right. they did. So we, we opened pretty much right after that. And it was the first time a brewery had ever been in St. Petersburg. Yeah. And that was actually due to some law changes that we actually had to do. That was like, we changed the laws in St. Pete to allow oh, really? that to happen. So you had to fight a load of red tape and, and get it done. For about two years, uh, we, we spent a lot of time downtown with city officials trying to talk them into just letting people have a brewery. Um, they had a hard time wrapping their heads around, you know, what it meant when we said that. Um, and so we actually had to take them over to like Tampa to Cigar City and let them see this is what a taste room looks like. This is what they're, and it was packed with people and community and they were like, oh, we, this is what you meant. Yeah, so. it's not just going to be a giant factory in the middle of town. But sure. Yeah, yeah. So when you opened, if you were the first brewery sort of in this area, locals probably wouldn't have been used to A, that, mm. those beers and B, that space. How did you open and with what kind of beer? Uh, yeah, so we definitely didn't make that easy on ourselves. We, uh, we opened right away making, you know, we're, we've always been a very hop-centric sort of American IPA uh, focused brewery as far as, you know, uh, ales go. Um, and then otherwise, we were the first brewery in the southeast of the country to ever own a fooder. We had one right away. And it was a 25 hectoliter custom built fooder. Um, tw you know, I would tell people it's 75% French oak, 25% American oak staves. And I gave them all the reasons why I decided to do that. And uh, it just fell sort of short. No one could knew what that meant, they let go, alone. That's cool, what's a fooder? <laughs> yeah, let alone, well, they couldn't even enunciate the word back to me, you know? And, I, and it wasn't anyone's fault. It was a lack of exposure yeah. that I was just naive enough to think that everyone was into the same thing I'm into. Uh, and so I had been drinking beers of, you know, the Britannomyces, focused beers, farmhouse ales, um, wild, sour, mixed culture beers, uh, but no one around us was. And so we opened our doors making those. So it was a little bit of an uphill battle um, right away. I mean, also just hop forward ales. There weren't, I mean, when we opened, less than 2% of all the beer sold in the state of Florida was craft beer. Right. So that's, that's probably mostly Cigar City. <laughs> Almost entirely. Actually, it was almost all Yingling, because right. Yingling is technically considered a craft brewery still, which I'm all cool with that because I like Yingling, and they actually have a brewery in Tampa. Right. Yingling does, and so um, so that's what most people were drinking. And sorry, my phone's going off. <laughs> um, so we opened trying to do, sell those. No one knew what that meant. Uh, so we had a we had a hard time early on trying mm -hmm. to like convince people that we weren't making this up and that. You know, it's this, not. This is a thing. This is, and it's this is how delicious. it's supposed to taste. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. And it's supposed to look, I guess, as well. Maybe sure. There's mild haze to it or stuff like that. Obviously, now haze, everyone's like, yeah, of course. Why isn't it more hazy? Yeah, it's exactly. The now they're now. upset that our hazy stuff isn't hazy enough. Yeah. I mean, what's <laughs> yeah. through that? What's yeah, exactly. Up? So we we definitely like our our year round core beer, and we have a few in the lineup. But our number one seller is ostensibly a West Coast IPA. It's called Sunshine City. It was funny because when we first made that beer. It actually was the second sort of core brand IPA we produced. The first one was called Green Bench IPA. Um, and that beer was more of a traditional West Coast IPA. Originally, it was actually a blend of Simcoe and Centennial. It was double dry hop, so it was still heavy on the sort of aroma flavor side of things, but it was meant to be a resin, dank, piney, soft citrus sort mm -hmm. of you know, uh, characteristic with a little bit of malt backbone. And then we made Sunshine City, which was meant to be a more tropical West Coast style. So I always call that one more of a Pacific Northwest because it was based off a lot of the beers. I'd made a bunch of trips to Portland in that last like year. I was there like three times in a year. And 
a lot of the IPAs I was having there were still clear and had a, a bitterness to them and were dry, but the aroma and the flavor were Never. just like, Citralet and, yeah. and these kind of more juicy hops. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very tropical. Yeah. So that beer was based off that. And that beer is double dry hopped as well. They're both over three pounds per barrel dry hop. Um, and they're, that one is Azaka Citra Mosaic. Whereas now, actually, Green Bench IPA is now Simcoe and Azaka. So we gave it a little bit more of a uh, tropical characteristic than what it originally had. And we backed off uh, completely on, on the caramel malt. There's a little bit of aromatic malt in there, a little Munich malt. but. Um, we kind of brightened it up a little bit more too because that's where the trend was going. So let's go back to the mixed firm stuff that you're doing, which you've been sure. doing since the start. I mean, that was A, a bold move out of the gate for a new brewery and B, just in terms of when you were doing that, it was quite early. Mixed firms only recently started to be understood. So how did you get that, that message out? I didn't. <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> still it, doing it. It did not work very well either. Um, yeah, I, honestly, uh, well, we're a little bit fortunate to be where we are. Like if I, I can, I can sit here and say like how difficult it was when we started and it was, but if we weren't in Tampa Bay, if we tried to open this anywhere else in Florida, it would have been even harder. You know, we, we had the benefit of having Cigar City. So some, we had a reference for Hot Port Hills, yep. but there was another brewery in town uh, specifically, which was uh, Rap Brewing uh, and Greg Rap, he actually unfortunately just passed away. Um, he's battled with cancer, but he a fantastic brewer, fantastic guy. Uh, him and I homebrewed together for years. Um, he was a great dude. He opened a small, small brewery. Although, ironically, a ton of taps. Though. Like he had like thirty, he has thirty taps or something. But on the one and a half barrel system, unbelievable. <laughs> but he, w but he got, he made he, quite a bit of a name for himself online for a goza that he was making. That at the time nobody had. Like yep. Westbrook's goza wasn't in cans. It wasn't anywhere. Like he was the only guy that was making it at the time. Um, and so. At the very least, some people had a point of reference for acidity, um, but when it came to actual true like mixed culture characteristics, meaning like Britannomyces flavor contributions and sort of any other wild Saccharomyces characteristics, which are not there flavors was no... you come across like in food or yeah. any of this. It's all like these horse blanket kind of stuff. It's just like I have no reference point other than the farm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and that. Uh, Honestly, the, the best descriptor I had was like, imagine you're at a petting zoo, and that's not always the greatest descriptor. So, um, so it was tough. Uh, honestly, our, uh, it was so hard that I ended up making a festival dedicated to kind of teaching, you know, trying to educate, and it was based on education. So we made this festival called Food for Thought. We just had our sixth annual uh, in March, which went really well. Um, it was also the same week that we opened uh, Web City Cellar, which we've actually, this term we've used since we opened, we've actually been, our first bottle release we ever did was a beer called For the Mad Ones, and it was in what's called the Web City Cellar Series. Mm -hmm. So we were doing these beers right when we opened. Actually, I think like one of the first beers, the first 10 beers I think I produced was like a barrel fermented uh, sour brown ale um, with a ton of rye. And uh, that was that beer for the Mad Ones. You were and just trolling people. Just went right, right in. Right. In cab saw the... barrels that I brought in from Napa. Like, it was just <laughs> unreal. And so that was our first release under the Web City Cellar. And our, I released, I think, eight beers in the first five years of us being open under the Web City um, uh, brand name. And then other various sour beers as we expanded and people, we had a little bit of a market as we grew. We just decided to, um, about two and a half years ago, we decided to, or three years ago, really, we decided to, to expand that program. So we had the facility next door for about four years. And so for three years, we built this plan of turning that into the Web City Cellar. So going from a 30 barrel, you know, closet um, that's climate controlled to a 4,000 square foot uh, warehouse that was climate controlled. So we climate controlled the entire space. We built the second tasting room in over there, dedicated to sour wild mixed firm beers uh, and farmhouse sales basically trying to eliminate all of the distractions that potentially would get in between, that we learned get in between the consumer and these products, uh, just having a bar, this tasting room open for the last you know, six years. So we took all of that and all the experience we had and just poured everything we possibly could into the cellar. Well, our interest was well and truly peaked and we couldn't wait to get a look at the Web City space. But first we needed a tour of the clean side of the brewery. So I handed over to Brad. Can we talk about why, why is it called Green Bench? Is that the oh, Green Bench? Oh, that's a good question. Let's we'll start there. 
Uh, so Green Bench is actually an old St. Petersburg reference, and we actually try to tie as much history as we can in most of the names that we, ha we have. So um, in the early 1900s, at one point, we had nearly 3,000 green benches in downtown St. Petersburg. Right. So the way that happened was, is um, you gotta think at the time, everything was centralized. Like there wasn't, there were no suburbs everywhere. Like everyone lived downtown and, and most of the businesses were owned by local people that lived here. Uh, and so these local businesses would like be on Central Avenue and first on each side of Central Avenue. Well, it was actually cooler to do your business outside than inside because of how hot it is in Florida. Right. Uh, and there was no central AC at the time. So they would sometimes bring out tables and chairs and benches and couches and do all their cell stuff outside. Right. And the city was like, this looks horrible. So get rid of these, we'll figure something out. So they had commissioned these benches to be made and they painted them green and everyone liked them. So then they had a bunch made. So then they adorned downtown St. Petersburg. So it got to a point eventually where any Saturday afternoon or Sunday you go outside and the benches were packed with people hanging out, just doing right. business, socializing, having a good time, enjoying the weather. Uh, Cause and we're a pretty social town. So um, we actually started marketing ourselves as the city of the green benches. So the city would take out ads in newspapers for snowbirds. We're in like Detroit and New York yeah, come and, on down and so come down to the time. city of the green benches. Yeah, and right. so that's what they did. So that's where okay. the green bench comes so from. So it really resonates with the local crowd then. This yeah. Is, this is like a piece of home. Absolutely. Amazing. So we've always wanted to kind of be St. Petersburg's brewery. We're all from here. I was originally born in Tennessee, but Nate and Steve were born here and I've been here for 20 plus years. So I, oh, I went from here yeah. now, come on. Uh, uh, so we, we grew up here together and um, it's not a, uh, you know, this town has always meant a lot to us. So we always kind of wanted to be known as this sort of St. Petersburg yeah. sort of staple if we could. And so that's where we, the name came from. Super cool. And like this, the tap room is, this is all like, like you were saying, this is like a local artist that made this. Absolutely. So our concrete bar top was made by a local artist. Um, uh, Epic Concrete is the name of his, his uh, company. And he actually makes a ton of uh, concrete work now for a lot of businesses in St. Pete. Yeah. So he does um, a bunch of like sinks for bathrooms. He actually did the back bar top there too. Um, underneath uh, we have hex block. These are actual hex block that were on the city uh, sidewalks of St. Petersburg that we salvaged. You like upcycled them and yeah. it's taking a bit of the local history. Absolutely. Back. Amazing. Um, and then, yeah, so local artists did a lot of the murals and stuff around here as well. So it's all local stuff for the most part. That's super cool. Should we have a look? Have yeah, a let's go place. take a look. Let's yeah. do it, man. We're canning today. So this is our top seller. This is the beer you're drinking. Sunshine City. Yeah. So this this was this is your core range yeah. uh, IPA. That's it. So yeah, we're canning this guy today. So uh, total capacity is about twelve thousand barrels of beer a year. Um, as far as stainless production goes, about ten thousand. And then we have a, a fooder. This is the first one in the southeast of the country. This was the first one, twenty-five hectoliter. So we'll do fooder fermented farmhouse sales. And then we do clean beers and then a bunch of mixed culture beers next door. Our brew house is a 15 barrel system. Yeah, not bad. What's the history of the building? It's quite a sort of grand, it looks like a grand barn or something. The space itself was built in the early 1900s. Uh, so it's, it's actually next, in the next eight years, I think it, it'll be 100 years old. Wow. So it was originally built as a, a body shop for like, I believe it was a Chrysler company dealership. So there's a building across the street that was their showroom, and this is where they worked on the cars, the machine cars. Yeah. Actually, we won, a, um, won an award up there. That's the St. Pete Preservation Award. Oh, wow. So because we preserved the building, we got a preservation award. It does, it does feel quite historic when you're in here. Like I think it, it's got sort of grandeur, and there's something about certain spaces that are quite special. Yeah, I think it elevates what you're drinking and so. the whole experience. That. I think it's special. It's a special place. I get that, that vibe off it. So this is our beer garden. So yeah, we got about epic space, man. Thank you. Thank Again. You. I love it. Thanks, man. Yeah, we got about 6,000 square feet worth of space. Uh, we dedicated about 900 square feet to sort of in a patio with uh, you know shaded area. Yeah. Um, we have a, a screen on the wall over there. We can project movies and you know whatever. Another mural that's up there. I love that. It's, it's sort of like those classic uh, welcome to Portland postcards yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So we had a ton of postcards. Actually, St. Pete was really known for its postcards. Actually, Pilsner, our Pilsner is called Postcard Pils. Ah. Um, we actually have an old inn, been around since the 50s uh, on St. Pete Beach called Postcard Inn. 
Um, so that was something else that we were really, as a tourist destination and encouraging people to come down here to visit, people would come down here and they'd get these unique postcards and they'd send them to their family. And then this is our Web City cellar. Actually, this is the front of it here. So what's, what's with the name Web, Web City? Another St. Petersburg reference. Yeah. So in the early 1900s, actually in 1925, a guy named Earl Doc Webb opened a drugstore called oh. Web City Drugstore. Uh, and at the time, it was a small drugstore. A little room, no bigger than the size of our taste room, which you'll see. You fast forward 20 years, and that small drugstore turned into a 77 department store. Oh. And he owned over seven city blocks. Wow. And, um, yeah, so it was... So like it, a true American success story. Kind absolutely. Of thing. Right, I guess. And he sold everything there. I mean, he yeah. sold... You could go get your hair done, you can buy toys, you can go grocery shopping, you could get drug, you know, get pharmaceuticals, you can get, get everything drugs. you need. Get drugs. All oh, right. Uh, we were a big drug town. <laughs> no. Um, so, no, it's all good. So Web City Drugstore was what it was yeah. called, and we Amazing. named it the Web City Cellar. He also coined this phrase, Web City Drugstore, because he kept the name once he expanded mm. and he says the war the world's most unusual drugstore so we coined the phrase web city seller uh, world's most unusual i saw seller. i saw a photo somewhere um walking here no way and it was it was huge on the on the side of a i think it was a building that was being re-renovated okay, or cool. whatever and it said the most unusual oh that's definitely so that's a that'll be st it. petersburg uh, be it. reference there but it was sure. a really old photo so that will be from where that's from that's what that's from wow i quite like that so it's a slight freak, freak show kind mm -hmm. of Come and check it out. We've yeah. got everything kind of vibe. I love that. It's great. So this is this is a new edition. New edition. We just opened about two and a half months ago. So these are actual Augusta blocks from the city streets of St. Petersburg. So these are all uh, bricks that we reuse. Reuse. Hopefully wow. this is open. Yeah, it is cool. All right. So this is our cellar. Come on in. Oh, lovely. Quite a different space, actually. Yes. Yes. It feels. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> So we'll do uh, mixed culture um, production over here. So uh, most of the beers that we produce over here are a blend of bacteria and wild yeast. Um, they'll then age in wine barrels for a long time, um, several months, nine months plus, um, sometimes two years or more. And then uh, we'll blend back, add whatever we want, depending on what the brand is, yeah. and then we'll package here. And then we'll go through a refermentation process usually on all the bottles that we do. Uh, in addition to that, we also increased our meat and cider program. We've been making meat and cider for about uh, almost four years now. Um, I guess it's three and a half years. And uh, at the time, we were basically making it in like a pseudo closet, kind of the same size as Web City Cellar used to be. Right, okay. uh, and now we, we've increased the capacity by tenfold. So we have like 15 barrel fermenters and a bright tank and some wine tanks for meads and all that kind of stuff. So Amazing. Yeah, so uh, over here, the actual taste room itself, you can see it's, it's sort of a tighter curated tap list. Uh, the next door, we have over 20 handles next door uh, with a bunch of different beers on. Over here, we only have 12, um, but they're, they're you know, again, um, more focused, I think. Um, we have we have Pills and Sunshine on, they're our top sellers, so we put yeah. those two on. And then um, other than that, we have, you know, I think four mixed firm beers, um, and then we have uh, four sort of wild beers, as we call them, which is like Britannomyces focused. Yeah. And then we have a couple ciders on as well. We, we were at a fork on the road a little bit, so we got this space about a year and a half or so after we opened the brewery, yeah. um, and we've had it since. And actually, it was just a warehouse. So we used it for storage. We had grain on racks and barrels. And we actually had offices in the back. Upstairs, there was like offices back there. Uh, we'll walk that way, too. Yeah, that's so, um, and we, we, tried, we were talking about it. We're like, well, what can you do with this space? I was like, well, first and foremost, we could absolutely turn this into a packaging hall. Like, I could easily put some trench drains on either side, drop a massive canning line in here, drop a bottling line, exactly. put a Ram centrifuge. Of that either. I, could, I, could put, I could put tanks, fermenters, all the way to that wall that we built. as much as you wanted to. I could make 30,000 yeah, yeah. barrels worth of beer if I wanted yeah. to in a year, just with these two spaces. And I said, or, and this was me and my two partners, and we're, we're literally standing right here, looking at this space, like, what do you think we should do? And I said, or, we could turn this into Web City. We could, we could, make, we could make this a destination spot between the two facilities, and we can use this to try to educate the consumer on these beers that we've been passionate about for years, that we've been trying to push forward. Yeah. That is scary, there's a lot of risk in that, because as we mentioned earlier, it wasn't easy selling these beers to start with. So we decided to pull the trigger. Amazing, I think that shows a lot of courage and uh, foresight. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs>
So we have barrels here. I have a capacity of about 700 wine barrels in this space. We have a 90 hectoliter fooder here. You want to see something else crazy? Yeah, man. Look up there real quick. You see that atlas? Yeah. So the original Web City in uh, the 50s, actually, the, 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 not the original one, the one that he first built, the big warehouse he built, had a guy holding an atlas over yeah. the sign. Yeah, he was called Atlas, the guy. Yeah. In ancient history, that's the name of the guy holding exactly. the world, yeah. This was the original sign that hung at Web City, the original Web City oh, wait. downtown. So we, we've been working with St. Pete uh, History Museum for the last several years, because this is a project we've been working on for a long time, the Web City. Yeah. And a lot of our beer names are in the Web City series are all named after things that you find at Web City. So they have a ton of original Web City memorabilia and, and actual items yeah. in just a warehouse somewhere. And so we've been working with them for a while. And so we, our idea and our hope is to actually turn the cellar somewhat into like a living museum. I love that. Where we constantly are displaying different pieces from the original Web City and then swapping them out over time uh, with information about them. So having plaques built with when this was made, where it was made, why it's significant to Web City, why it's significant to St. Petersburg, and sort of preserve a lot of the history of St. Petersburg. With that said, we spent a lot of time, we're pretty dedicated to telling the whole truth. Um, St. Petersburg, like all of the South, was segregated, right. you know? Uh, I myself, like, I'm a, I'm a black man. My mother's black, my father, I'm technically biracial, but I grew up with a black family and I, identify as a black man I always have since I was a kid and those those elements are really important not just to me but my partners to always discuss that not shy away from that yeah so for example the green benches weren't for anyone that was not white wow. I mean it was white people right. only it was segregated you could not sit on there if you were a person of color so there's something even more powerful about that name to me it's taking um, it back a, a black man owns the green bench yeah. for the first time we own that like that is ours i actually hosted a family reunion here uh two years ago i had 200 dickersons which is my mother's maiden name uh and it was all black folk 200 black folk just descended upon green bench and we all partied and it was amazing and that was a big moment for me web city was the same way web city actually went through that as well uh the naacp sued doc webb uh, trying to allow, or and that, not that he was against having black people in his facility, he actually was the opposite. He was one of the only people in St. Petersburg that actually employed a ton of African Americans right. uh, that lived here in St. Petersburg. He, he employed at one point over 1,400 people. He carried us through the Great Depression, literally. Now, with that said, his food counters were whites only. And so there were actual sit ins where African-American citizens came and sat in at these food counters and were discriminated against because they had to sit there. But it speaks volumes that they chose Web City as the place to sit because that place was so popular and so influential so much to, to the city. Yeah. The city in general. Yeah, man, I think it's powerful. I like, I love the fact you've got the name back. That's fucking awesome. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty yeah. special. And that's sick, anyway. That, it's that's, cool, that's, it's that's, so cool, isn't it? That's yeah. cool as fuck, <laughs> whatever it is. Oh, it's really Even rad. if the guy was maybe a bigger. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, this isn't bad. I mean, the city's pretty, man. And it's, uh... There are worse places in the world, there right? There are worse places in the world. No. We've got AC. Yeah. You're making awesome beer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That's what, what it's all about. Here's what got me into beer. There's two things. The first, well, there's three things. First of all, beer's just cool. Like, it's easy to get into beer. Everybody likes beer. Beer's cool. That part's easy. The second one was, I will wake up the rest of my life trying to learn. I will never know everything about beer. I'll, I'll never know it. And through it, I can discover a lot of things. Because through it, I've discovered a lot about myself and about the people that I love in the world, you know, and, and I, my city and my family. Like, I've learned a lot th about them through beer. That's pretty powerful. The last one was the community. You know, the first time I went to a homebrew club meeting, I walked in, nobody looked like me. You know, like, it wasn't a, and there were people from all kind of walks of life but they shared a passion. They yeah, cared about that, there's they something, shared. Exactly, there's something about that community. Uh, it doesn't matter where you're from or what your background is or anything like that. 
you have a shared interest yeah. and that, that unites people. And I think that it doesn't matter if it's beer or whatever you're into, it's power, isn't it? There's something there. Yeah. Share, sharing of knowledge. Anytime you can connect with a person, you know, that's, that's what it's about. Like one today, they don't say things the same.